<laughs> we work well together. <laughs> so we, we, we will record it and uh, we will uh, make it available for everyone that's uh, signed up for this event afterwards. So you'll get a link to it. Uh, I'd like to say also that uh, we'll talk about Latix, uh, the company Latix and their technology, which is quite special. Um, and we've been working with that technology for about nine years now and, and have excellent uh, experiences and uh, quite a few customers in the Nordics. So Sean, uh, with those words, I'll leave the scene to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And, uh, you know, I'll reiterate, you know, um, similar comments is, is you've been uh, one of our best partners for a long time and, and we're very appreciative of all the work you do in the Nordics. So, um, you know, certainly things like this. So, um, yeah, so uh, today, as I was saying, we're, we're going to talk about um, it, three simple ways to prevent software architecture erosion. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as Michael was saying, my name is Sean Barrow. I'm, I'm the um, director of sales and marketing here at, at Latix. Um, and I want to you know, thank you for uh, attending this. And as you can see on my screen, um, you know, understand, measure, and control. Um, you, we kind of feel that this, these are the three ways to prevent software um, architectural erosion. The first one, you know, we understand your current architecture, which we'll um, you know, show today. Uh, measure um, what your, uh, or you know, monitor your architecture with specific architectural metrics that uh, Latix has, and. Um, you know, finally control or enforce your desired architecture with design rules. So as, as Michael was saying, um, you know, we, a lot of times people will start with a, a good architecture and then there's no way to control that or enforce that. And, and we have these, uh, this concept of design rules, which allow you to set up what you want the desired architecture to, to be. And then going forward, if there's violations to that architecture, it'll be flagged. And so you'll know that there's um, problems with the, with the architecture. Um, and that's, you know, it's a great way to stop this architectural erosion, which happens, unfortunately, in, in most software projects. So, um, so you know, we'll start with a, with a definition of software architectural erosion. So these, uh, we see this as, as uh, dependencies which violate your intended architecture, um, sort of what you, what you want the um, original architecture to be. Um, crossing uh, layer or, or component boundaries, um, you know, just bad dependencies. And, and these types of couplings um, prevent intended architecture. You, you may say, I, I want everything to be modular and, and to be able to be reused. And, you know, if you, if you start to have these uh, bad dependencies, that can really, um, you know, be slowed down and stopped. Uh, and, th and that leads to higher defect levels. Um, you know, with, with the increasing uh, complexity of, of the architecture and harder for, for developers to understand. And, you know, all of this just increases the costs of, um, you know, building the software, testing the software, maintaining your, your software. Uh, so, you know, we see architect your, your architecture and, uh, you know, it's just critical to um, the overall maintainability of, of your, your software. And, um, you know, we really try to help companies uh, control this software architectural erosion. Um, that's you know sort of what we're we're aiming to do. Um, and uh, you know just a little bit um, again you know as I said at the top, uh, you know we're, there are three ways with Latix that you can pre prevent software architecture erosion. The first one is understand. So uh, understand what your architecture is. Uh, if you're familiar with with Latix a little bit, you know that we have this uh, DSM view which is a dependency structure matrix. Uh, I'll show that in more detail. And we also have a, a CAD view or conceptual architecture view. And the, these are great um, ways of, of getting a, that big picture view of your entire architecture um, and really understanding what your architecture is today. A lot of times companies will come to us and, and they will have had an architecture at the beginning and, and now two, three years down the road, um, they, they don't know what their architecture looks like. And, and there could be architectural erosion, and, and we can give you that view into, okay, this is what the architecture looks like today. And, uh, you know, then you can, from that point, once you understand what it is, you can start to um, change it or, uh, you know, update it to, to improve modularity, um, you know, things like, things along those, those lines. Um, again, I, 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 
you know, we also have these architectural metrics, which are a great way to um, measure and monitor your architecture over time. So you can watch things like system cyclicality, which is, um, you know, measure of, of cycles in, in your system. And, you know, is, is that going up over time? You know, so you're adding cycles to your, your software, bad dependencies. Um, and then the last one is, is control. Um, you know, this is a, a, another critical piece to Latex is, is uh, you really can control what your architecture is going to be with these design rules. So you can say, I, I don't want dependencies between certain components. Um, I don't want, you know, um, other, you know, I want to keep the layering that we have. And you can enforce all those things with design rules. And, and I'll show all that in the, in the product today. Um, so as, as a, a starting point, um, you know, I, I think this is, um, you know, when people think of, of de dependency analysis and our architecture, um, you know, they, they usually see a, a graph type of picture like this. Um, the problem with this is, is that it's hard to see which dependencies are bad. Um, you know, this really doesn't scale well. Um, you know, if, if you look at something like this, you know, you can't really see which things are in cycles. You can't see which things are, are uh, crossing component boundaries or layer boundaries um, and, and, you know, could cause maintainability problems. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, even though this is this is intuitive for people to understand, you know, which which dependencies are between which things, it's just hard to get that big picture view. Um, and that's where we introduce this uh, dependency structure matrix, which, which, as I said, you know, if you're used to uh, Latex, uh, you're probably familiar with with this. I'll, I'll go into more detail on, on the uh, dependency structure matrix as I get into the product. But it's it's just a scalable way to um, see all these dependencies and to understand what your architecture is. Uh, as I said, a lot of times people will load in their software and, uh, you know, we give them a view of what the architecture is today. They may have a, an idea of what it was, what it's supposed to be, but we can give you an as-is view um, and help you understand that. Um, and you, know, you can also see that the CAD view behind it. Um, you also have a, um, an, a, a way of, of looking at things in, in more of a, a conceptual architecture type of view. Um, so with that, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through an example today um, called ISO AG Lib. This is a uh, open source library for electronic data communication. Uh, it's a C, C++ library. And um, the reason we, we have it is, is on their website, they have a um, picture of what their architecture is supposed to look like. Uh, so here's their defined architecture. Um, you, know, you can see this it's clearly structured there's there's modules here um, you know every all the dependencies are going in the right direction um, you know and this is a, a good picture this is sort of as Michael was talking about the top is when you start a project you know this is probably the idea that you have in your mind is is this is what it's going to look like um, and the problem is 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 that um, you know this isn't always uh, viewable to everybody you know the developers may not have this picture in their mind um, and they may not know when they have problems, you know, they, they cause problems to the ar this architecture. And there's no way to sort of monitor that over time. Um, and that's where the value of, of Latex comes in. Um, so from at this point, I'm, I'm going to switch over to Latex and uh, show this same ISO AG lib in um, the Latex software itself. So. Here I've I have um, I've loaded ISO AG Lib in here. Uh, as you can see here, there's uh, 77,000 lines of code. You know, small embedded project, um, and I've created a, a, a DSM here. So um, you can see the same pieces: the the COM scheduler, HAL, and driver. Um, and there's actually a couple things in here: util and star, which weren't in the original picture. So immediately you can see deviations from that desired architecture um, and it, you know so it's decomposed into these five modules com scheduler hal util and star uh, so the the way you read a um, dsm so the dependencies for com here are um, down column one so you know in this picture you can see that com has dependencies on scheduler uh, HAL, driver, util, and star. So, you know, it has dependencies on, on everything. Um, and you can see that in the rows, in rows two, three, four, uh, five, and six, which you correspond to, you know, to, the, to those pieces. One of the major benefits of this approach is that it 
it scales better um, than that graph view that I saw that I showed before. So you can really see all the pieces to this, um, and it you know to the uh, equivalent directed graph. Um, the uh, other piece of this is is you can see that the um, the numbers here. Uh, 39, 4, 122, uh, all those are, are um, usage-based. Uh, so we have um, usage-based dependencies. So we assign the strength of the dependency to be the number of uses based on a count of the references during static analysis. So we will do an analysis of, of your software at the beginning and, and pull out all the dependencies. And uh, you know, so in this case, we can tell you exactly how many dependencies there are between um, any of these these pieces. Um, so using the uh, DSM to model software architecture is, is uh, uh, we see it as an iterative approach, uh, uh, iterative process. It, it you know it involves domain knowledge of the system being represented, um, and it and the use of the uh, DSM can you can be used to verify your architectural knowledge or just your intuition of, of what the system looks like. Um, you know, so, so the key steps in, in creating a DSM and, and uh, discovering the right system decomposition for this, uh, you know, there's, there's a number of steps. Uh, you know, here we're showing, um, you know, in an existing system like ISO AG Lib, you know, you look, you look for how the developers have organized the code structure of the system. So generally, that maps to a directory structure of how the code is organized, uh, and that's shown here. That's that's the starting point. So we have um, the direct, just the directory structure of of what things look like. Um, an architect can then go in and, and edit DSM by moving systems around to reflect what the architecture, uh, what, what they know the architecture already uh, is, you know, so which, which subsystems should be grouped together. In this case, you can see that uh, two known subsystems are, weren't in the original picture, as I pointed out at the beginning, util and star. Uh, so, you know, one of the big features of Latix is, is that it's, um, it's an editor. So I can go in as an architect and say, you know, util, this shouldn't be its own uh, separate subsystem. This, you know, let's say that maybe this should be as part of driver. So I can move it to driver and now it's it's part of there. You, 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 this is sort of what if analysis. So what if I move things into, uh, move util somewhere else? Uh, what is that gonna do? And as I as I make changes, it's, it's also gonna create a work list. So I've you can see the changes that you make. I've, I've made a change to um, the architecture and moved the um, util into driver here. Um, and you know, I'm not changing the code, I'm just changing the view here. And any, any of these changes can also be uh, backed out. So I can move back and uh, you know, have util like that. And you know, maybe that's not what I wanna do, but you can kind of move things around and, and get your desired architecture. Um, and, and that's you know sort of the first piece to this. Next, um, what you, you can also apply DSM partitioning algorithms to discover um, unknown patterns or, or to verify the architect's knowledge and intuition about the uh, the system. Um, Latix Architect has a rich set of, of algorithms for architectural discovery and management. Uh, you know that they help identify layering and componentization within the software system, even as um, after the architectural intent has eroded um, in, in you know, certainly in situations like this. Uh, so, you know, so large systems can be analyzed quickly by applying many of these algorithms and sharpening the understanding of the software system. So to apply a partitioning algorithm, I, I go to our partitioning icon here and uh, select one of the algorithms. In this case, I'm gonna choose the uh, component algorithm. Um, and this is going to move things into uh, components. Um, as you can see, in this case, it's made things into uh, you know one big component. And the reason is is that because everything here is is tightly coupled. So you know, com, scheduler, hal, driver, util, star are all tightly coupled here. Um, and you know, it, it also moved the dependencies into um, a situation where the majority of them are below the diagonal. So um, uh, Dependencies above the diagonal are, are uh, backwards or, or uh, dependencies or, or cycles. So you can quickly see which dependencies are, are um, you probably should start taking a look at. Um, and then, you know, you can, as I was saying, you can apply an iterative approach to this and, and slowly uh, make changes to, to the software. So you can, um, you can do things like, you know, hide dependencies. So I can, 
decide, you know, I, I don't think there should be uh, dependencies between driver and comp, so I can hide those dependencies. I can say, okay, here are all those dependencies, and I can hide them. I can, um, and now apply partitioning again and see, you know, see what, how that's changed. Okay, so that's now made COM its own module. Uh, so that's good. That's, that's what it was in the original picture. And you can keep kind of doing this iterative approach. Um, and again, as, as I was saying, is, you know, the, it keeps track of everything that I've changed in the work list. So you can have a, this is something you can give to a developer and say, I, I want you to go make these changes to, uh, to improve our architecture. So it's, it's actionable information that you can then go in and take and, and uh, do things with. Um, you know, the, the next piece, so once you sort of understand the, the architecture, you can also um, apply design rules to these. Um, so I can, I can do things like um, create layering rules. And it's, it's now, now I actually have a layer here. So I have a comm layer and I have everything else. So you can see, um, hopefully this is clear enough, um, like this a little bit bigger. But you can see I've, I've added, um, when I added those rules, I added uh, rules here, and it's these yellow triangles are, are the rules. Um, and so if in the future anybody uh, violates those rules, it's going to come up with a, um, with a red triangle. So if I go back and I back out um, those changes and then apply uh, those rules again, so if I apply a rule here, you can see it's, it's created a violation here. So there shouldn't be violations to drivers. And, and you can also create reports for any of these violations. And you can run this at compile, compile time to uh, see what violations are, are created each build. Um, and uh, you know, so this is a great way to enforce the architecture. So this is something architects or developers can go in and set up rules uh, to enforce whatever architecture they, they want in their software. Um, and it, you know, auto, like I was saying, it automatically gets flagged. Uh, so it, the design rules enforce the discipline of, of uh, how software systems can interact with each other, allowing for sort of an orderly evolution of the software architecture. Uh, you, you can use design, and as I was saying at the top, you can also use design rules to prevent architectural erosion uh, that often occurs as systems evolve. As, as you can see in this case, this, there's been um, a, a lot of architectural erosion in, in this case. Um, and so the DSM you know, just provides a systematic and comprehensive way to ensure the, that architectural intent is expressed and maintained. Um, there's also a, um, a CAD view, as, as I was uh, talking about, uh, that you can create. And, and this is another view of the, the architecture. And this is very customizable. Um, so it's, you can go in and, and um, move things around. Um, so here's ISO EG lib. So if we just click into that, you can now see the, the comm, scheduler, HAL, driver, util, and star that we had in the, the DSM. Um, and I can apply the same partitioning to this. I can say, um, you know, I, I want to see um, uh, you know, what, what the, you know, what things look like here. Um, and then, you know, open these things up and, and see what's, what's inside, inside of them. Um, you know, these are good pictures that you can have for, for the software, um, you know, and, and what all the dependencies are between different things. Um, you know, views like this can also be exported. Uh, so you can export any of these uh, to, you know, XML, JPEG, uh, PNG, any one of these formats uh, can be exported out to. Um, and, you know, so you, you can kind of move things around and, and uh, create the view that you want. Uh, with, with all of these things. Um, so um, with that, I'm, I'm going to move over to, um, you know, so, so using combination with the DSM, the CAD is, is just a, another powerful way of communicating the architecture. Um, and that, that was, you know, communicate, measure, and control. Uh, you know, the communicate is, is the DSM and CAD and, and the design rules of the control and uh, you know, finally, we're going to look at um, the measure piece, and and that for that, I'm going to uh, move to a different um, tool that we have, and that's called uh, Latix Web, and this is a um, something that you can view on our website. So this is uh, Latix.com, and then under products, you can go to Latix 
Latex Web, and we have a demo site for our Latex Web product, um, which I'll click into here. Um, you know, in, in this case, you can, um, you know, we're now looking at, uh, you know, so the, so that, you know, this is a great way to um, prevent architectural erosion by measuring the erosion over time. Um, and, uh, you know, so while projects are in development, changes are taking place every day. So Latex Web can become part of your continuous integration system. And we can see if the architecture is eroding as you're changing the code. You know, are we introducing violations to the architecture? Are we, are things getting better because we applied our refactoring initiative? Uh, with Latex Web, we can measure and quantify that, those improvements. Um, so right now we're looking at the dashboard of projects. Uh, there's two projects, one's, uh, uh, or three projects. There's the Ant um, project, demo project, which is a Java project. There's also the ISO AG Lib, which is a C++ project. And uh, we also created a Cry engine, which is a gaming um, development engine, which is also a C++ project. Uh, but, you know, this gives you some information on, uh, you know, high level of, of what's going on. You know, so we have 12 snapshots in here. Um, you know, system stability has been going down. Complexity has, has been um, getting better. Um, system stability has been getting worse. Uh, there's 67 violations in this, this architecture. Um, so let's go inside the ISO AG Lib project. And, uh, you know, so we're looking at the uh, snapshot for uh, version 2.7.0. Um, as you can see, you can, you can get a view of a DSM. Uh, you can also get a, um, a CAD view. So you can see the, the CAD version of um, the architecture. Um, so you know, anybody who has access to the web can go in and, and look at any of these um, you know, projects. Again, it's a great way to uh, allow people to see the architecture uh, and, and communicate that out to everyone. So um, let me go into you know, some of the reports that we have. Um, so there's the um, system metrics. Um, um, data here, and this is, so the first report we're looking at is the system metrics de delta, and uh, we're, we're going to do a diff between versions uh, 2.7 and 2.61. Um, we can see that how the, you know, how the line count has changed, so, um, and we can see you know, the number of classes, um, and that, you know, the, the head of file count and the source file count, um, you know, a lot of basic information on the, um, the, the system itself, um, you know, then we can go further and, and look at architectural metrics. Uh, we can see, you know, that complexity has, has increased. Um, we can see that uh, system cyclicality has um, also increased. So, you know, you're, you're adding more cycles to the, to the software. Uh, so, you know, the software is eroding a little bit as, as we were you know, talking about before. Um, and we can look at what the cycles are. Um, you know, so we can, we can click on a report and see all of the different cycles. Um, you know, in, you know, this one has a large number of cycles. Uh, you know, we can also see, uh, violations. So we can see violations of the architecture. Again, anybody with a web browser can go in and, and check these out. Um, and, uh, so, you know, any sort of system level metrics, uh, we can also look at architectural changes. So as as I again as I was saying we, we're looking at version 2.7 versus uh, 2.61, but we can diff against any uh, other version that you've you've put into this repository, um, and we can see you know we can see any um, new atoms that have been added. So this is new classes or, or new um, structures that have been added to the product. Um, any new violations. Um, so any anything that you've added to the product. In, since, since these versions, so you can see what's changed over time. Um, if you've added any new violations, so in this case, they added one new violation, so you can check out what that violation is. Um, changed atoms, anything you've changed, anything that you've deleted, or any uh, missing violations, things that you've, you've possibly fixed. Um, these can all be, be uh, seen here. Um, and then you, there's, a, there's a number of other different metrics. Uh, you can see, you know, Package size, um, you know, which again looks at, you know, large packages are uh, probably also have a lot of complexity to them. Um, but you can see things like complexity over time. You can see, you know, is, is complexity getting better? Is it getting 
worse. Um, same thing with system cyclicality. In, in this case, you can see that um, you know we started with a system cyclicality of uh, you know 40 percent, and uh, you know now we're up to 49 percent. So clearly, we're adding more cycles to the to the software over time. Um, so this is a good indication that the software is eroding. Um, again, uh, system stability is another nice one to look at. Uh, we started with a system stability of 71 percent. And now we're down to uh, 66%. Again, you can see that the software is eroding. Uh, so it's, you know, this is a great proactive way of looking at it. As you can say, you know, I'm watching these metrics and and things are getting worse. So uh, you know, we probably need to to keep track of these things. Um, you know, violations uh, doing they're doing a pretty good job with violations. They started with uh, 77 and now they're down to um, you know 67, which is good. You know they, they can, but if if you wanted to improve system stability and system cyclicality, um, you know maybe go after some of these violations, go and fix some of these. Um, you know a lot a lot of good actionable information here. Um, so we looked at you know how Latix Web can be you know integrated in and made part of the continuous integration system. Uh, so we have a command line, all all the functionality that you can do with Latix Architect uh, can be done also on the command line. So um, you can run this, as I was saying, it's part of a continuous integration system or, or part of your build. So every time you do a build, you can add to this repository and uh, you know, update the project, up, see violations, see changes to the architecture, and see you know, what changes you've made to the code and you know, how the metrics are affected and you know, whether the, the architecture is eroding. Um, you can look at all these trends and zero in on exact dependencies that might be causing violations and, and eroding the architecture. Um, so uh, with that, you know, that's uh, what I wanted to show with Latix Architect. Um, I'm going to go back and, and um, uh, start, you know, um, just show a couple things with um, the, just kind of show you a context of, of how Latix Architect works in, in the um, development life cycle. Uh, so Latix Architect is a, is a desktop product. This is something you'd be using on your desktop. Um, and once you check in changes, you can go and um, run, as I was saying, Latix on the command line and um, update the project and see what, what's changed. So you know what metrics are affected, um, what violations the architecture you may, you may have introduced, what cycles you may have introduced. And all that information can either be viewed on the web or emailed out to, to everyone so that everyone can be notified of, of any success or failure with the architecture. We have integrations with, with um, things like Jenkins um, and, and um, we'll be soon, soon coming out with a Sonar Cube integration. So we're, we're really in, uh, integrated in with, with the continuous integration system. Um, and finally, uh, you know, just a little bit about Latix. Uh, We've been around since 2004 with this software architecture analysis software. Um, the this DSM technology has roots out of MIT, um, and uh, our founder um, Niraj Sengal worked with MIT to to create this, and he has a number of patents around uh, this DSM technology. Um, we're sold in 22 countries worldwide. Um, you know, uh, obviously the Nordics uh, is a big region for us, but uh, you know, you'll see a lot of um, big name companies here, and and that's the, those are the types of companies we typically um, work with is is large companies that have uh, you know complex um, software uh, and um, you know having uh, you know issues that you know with architectural erosion and, and those types of issues. So um, with that, that was everything I wanted to show. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, Let's see if there's any questions. Um, we had a question, uh, Sean, on yeah. um, how does Latix compare to SonarCube? What basic things you get mm -hmm. SonarCube yeah. DSMs? Absolutely, yeah. So um, you know, we see so we, as I said at the end, uh, you know, we we came out with um, an integration with SonarCube. So you can, uh, we, we see Latix as very complementary to, to their products. Um, they really focus on code level uh, information, you know, static analysis. Uh, you know, so they'll find things like buffer overflows and with C, C++ and you know, pointers that are um, you know, memory problems, things like that. Um, you know, we really focus on the sort of the bigger picture. Um, you know, so 
specifically dependencies. Uh, so you can import any information um, from Latix into Sonar Queue, uh, and that, that should be coming out uh, very shortly um, with this information. But we we see ourselves very complementary, just just like any other uh, static analysis solution, like a Clockwork or a Gramma Tech, uh, any of those uh, or Coverity. We see them as as complementary technologies because we're really focusing on it on a different um, area. From my experience, uh, the unique features with uh, the DSMs that Latix is using is that you can play around with the architecture. You can save a concept of architecture for later use and compare yes. it to the actual architecture. Yeah, all, yeah. That, all, I mean, yeah. along the time, and that's the, the neat and unique feature with mm -hmm. the Latix DSM. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's that's absolutely the right, Michael. Is, is um, you know, Sonar Cube does have a DSM. It's it's re, it's in read-only mode. Um, you know, but ours, it, it, it's the big feature is is it's editable, um, and you can you know, we, you can also create these design rules to to control your software architecture over time. So, um, you know, we're really happy that they see the value of DSMs, and um, you know, we take it that one step forward. And as I was saying, is you know, that's one of the patents that Niraj has is, is around this concept of an editable DSM. So. There is another question. How do you measure system stability? Is it connected to test? So. Um, no, it's, it's not connected to, to test. Um, it's connected to um, the impact of changes. So it's, we, we look at the entire system and um, look at all the dependencies and you know if if you it's the um, percentage of the system that will be affected if you make a change somewhere so if if um, if, if you have the system stability of 90 percent say uh, that means when you make a change there's a, on average you only make be change be affecting 10 percent of the um, uh, of the application which is you know good. I mean, and and it, I mean in that case, it does have a connection to test. Is is you know a higher system stability um, means that uh, you know you 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 have a better chance of of um, or it's you know easier to test because you don't have a lot of impact. Uh, so you don't have to run as many tests. You can you can really make sure each test is focused on one piece of functionality. Um, so, but it doesn't have a you know, direct correlation necessarily to um, to test and I, I guess you know that that was a point that I probably should have uh, showed in, in Latix architect is you can do impact analysis of uh, each release so it's um, let me just show that real quick since it's a, it's a big feature um, so in Latix web um, you know as I was saying you can go in and, and um, make any changes to the um, you can view any differences between different releases. You can also do uh, an impact report. So you can look at an impact report. Uh, you know, in this case, I'm looking at snapshot 2.7.0 and again, 2.6.2. And I can see what this does is it, it takes all the changes you've made to the software and then looks at um, all the dependencies on those changes. And it'll give you an impact report. In this case, it's, it's, six, it's six levels of, of um, impact, so it's all the direct impacts and all the indirect impacts. And so on the um, left-hand side here is everything that's changed, and then on the uh, uh, the right-hand side is everything that's that's affected by those changes. So um, you know you can use this in terms of testing to see which things um, need to be tested. So you know obviously you're going to test everything that's changed, but um, you know you should also test everything that's affected by those changes. So uh, all those things, and you can get, you know, all of that information here, and then go down to the next level and see what's indirectly affected by those changes, uh, and, you know, all the way down to transitive closure and everything that's, that's possibly affected by this. So in terms of um, testing, this is a great um, report in, to find out all the impacts of your, your changes to the software. Yeah, my experience is people, well, they want to know what they need to test. But even more valuable is to know what you don't have to test again. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if, if you're, you know, if it takes a long time to run all of your tests, 
you're, you're exactly right. Is that that's uh, very valuable information, and and we have um, have had customers take this report and map it to tests, so they can see, um, you know, they don't have to run their entire suite of tests. They can run just a um, a subset of those and and find um, problems quicker. You know, it's, I mean, in this day and age, it's all about um, you know failing fast. So it's it's about finding uh, defects as as quickly as possible. And so if you, if you can use it, a report like this to um, to do that, you know, there's, there's a lot of value there. So, so there's a question connected to this um, <laughs> from the audience: How can we measure the impact for the multiple distributed components? Um, I guess I'm, I'm unclear what they mean by multiple distributed components. Uh, yeah, me too. Maybe, yeah, yeah, I need to uh, clarify. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me, for example, we have uh, a production environment where uh, two, three components are actually running and uh, they are connected through uh, web services or some REST API. So uh, can we uh, measure the impact in that case? For example, component A has uh, made some changes which actually impacts the component B and C. So is there is anything that we can measure the impact on component B and C while uh, the component A is changed? Okay. So uh, let me answer. I am a. Uh, this is my name is Neeraj Sangal. I'm from Ladix, and I'll answer that question. Uh, first, first is when you have multiple elements changed, then you can, if you can tag those multiple elements as changed, then you can measure the impact. We know that, uh, or I presume you got that part already. So the next part is we have these things connected by web services, and one component changes, and now therefore anybody that's doing it, and that is something that can still be done, but you would have to make sure that you had a relationship between them. So normally when you do an analysis, you may not get that relationship because it's a runtime relationship. And as you know, you're processing source code, so you're getting the static relationships. But Lattice does allow you to add other relationships as well. And so to the extent that you had a dependency there, yes, you could do it. Just have to be careful if that dependency exists in your model or not. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, but uh, can you please explain it further? Like uh, how actually uh, Latex would help us, for example, uh, in a distributed environment, like uh, components are uh, running on different machine, but our source code definitely would be at uh, some Git repo. Uh, but uh, there are the different repos. So, how do you actually manage, uh, or the uh, or this report can actually help us to find the impact if uh, the component A has uh, made some changes that would actually broken some changes in component B, C, and others. others so, right. so that's what I yeah. said. In other words, you need a relationship there. And, to, and as long as there is that dependency that exists, so if you had a dependency that component B depended on component A and you changed component A, then you would actually un see in the propagation chain that I changed component A, therefore component B is affected. Now, notice that you're at this time not talking of files or source code, you're actually talking about components. And what's going on here is that are mixing runtime with with static elements. And as I said, Latix is a general tool. So to the extent that you have the, the dependencies between them and Latix gives you the tools to even build a model which says I have component A, B, and C, and component A depends on component B and allows you to specify that. Then you would be able to get it. So that's the issue of being able to specify those dependencies. And if you can, then Latix impact report will pick it up and let you know. Okay, thank you. There was another question. Uh, does Latix support pr uh, support TOGAF framework or, or some other enterprise architecture framework? Um, so Latix um, 
And so these are enterprise frameworks like uh, TOGAF or MODAF. Uh, uh, and some of them come from the Department of Defense, uh, Air Force, uh, Europe has another one. I don't remember the name right now. Um, and Latix out of the box does not support any of these frameworks. Uh, Latix does support, for instance, U loading in UML models, loading in SysML models. And, to, and if there was a TOGAF model or a MODAF model, then the user would have to do some work to be able to transform that model into an LDI, which is Latix's XML representation. And then you would be able to see it in the form of a DSM. We actually be able to look at the model and look where the model level couplings are. Uh, and that's something that has been of interest to me uh, for many years uh, because I spent a lot of time working in UML uh, and so on as well. And when you do that, you do see lots of model coupling, but out of the box for TOGAF, MODAF, or any of those uh, enterprise models, uh, there isn't a support available uh, that we have built. Of course, we have the generic tools so that somebody else could take that and generate the XML, and then you would be able to load it. Thank you, Nirash. Uh, we don't seem to have any further questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think yeah, that was if we had if you have later plans to to support things like TOGAF. Yeah, so right now we do support, for instance, um, uh, uh, IBM's Rhapsody, uh, an enterprise architect, uh, Sparks Enterprise Architect, or Magic Draw. So some we have support for some of for those already uh, built in, and that's something that could come in future. It all depends on the, the you know how many people want it and uh, if it is commercially viable for us to do. Okay, I think that was the questions, and um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone. But before we leave, I just want you to know that if you're interested, there's much more uh, information on the latix.com. There's lots of useful videos to understand the concept of how you work with latix. Um, and you're also welcome to request a an evaluation version. So we'll be happy to help you, help you get started with Latix. No problem, just get in touch with Know-how and, and we will help you with that. As I said early on, we will uh, we have recorded the meeting and we will uh, send you the link to the recording so you can distribute among your colleagues if you wish. <coughs>